I truly believe that every day is a gift and happiness is a choice. And you can't change everything around you, but you can change what you do. All of that plus a glass of wine and watch the sunset when we're good. <laughs> That was Jeannie Seeley. Jeannie is a talented ball of fire who is not hesitant to challenge status quo. A longtime member of the Grand Ole Opry, she speaks with honor about that hallowed stage and the institution, but does not hesitate to challenge norms and break down silos when it comes to equality, especially for women. Let's learn about this maverick who's intent on giving back and making the entertainment world better for everyone. I'm Sally Hussey, the CEO of 50 Forward. And we elected to launch this podcast because we know older adults have such inspiring stories and wisdom worth sharing. We have now all learned that social connections are critical to our well-being. This podcast is made possible by 50 Forward, the leading resource for adults 50 plus in Middle Tennessee who seek to live longer, more fulfilling lives. You're listening to Squeeze the Day, where we talk to extraordinary people over the age of 50 who are living their best life now. Their stories of a well-lived life are both inspiring and encouraging to all of us as we seek to navigate a meaningful and purpose-driven second chapter in our life. Today's Squeeze the Day is brought to you by the All of Us Research Program from the National Institutes of Health. Learn how you can help change the future of health by participating in the program. Visit www.joinallofus.org to learn more. I'm Susan Sizemore, Communications Director for 50 Forward, so let's get started. So welcome, Jeannie. Well, thank you so much. Yes, I'm over 50, and I am living my (laughs) very best life now. (laughs) So tell us all a little bit about your roots. My roots, well, I was born and raised in northwestern Pennsylvania, and uh, we lived up way out in the country. Our little 38-acre farm bordered the Pennsylvania State Game Reserve lands. So beyond our little farm, there was miles of wilderness, and to me, it was just a huge playground. I loved being out in the woods, and I still do. So how'd you get to Nashville from Pennsylvania? Oh, my goodness. I took the long way around (laughs) from Pennsylvania to Nashville by way of L.A. (laughs) When I finished school and started and worked a couple of years, and uh, I joke about everybody thinks that I moved to Southern California to start my career But I didn't. I moved to get out of the Northeast winters (laughs) because my first car was a 1958 MGA Roadster, and I buried it in a snowdrift on Easter Sunday morning. And I'm like, oh, every step walking home through the snow, I thought, you know what? There's got to be someplace else to live. (laughs) And truthfully, I had seen Southern California on TV, and it looked pretty cool to me. So (laughs) a girlfriend had an Austin Healy, and we took two of my cousins, and and we drove those two sports cars to Southern (laughs) California, to Santa Monica Beach. What could go wrong, right? (laughs) (laughs) But when you're 21, you're not afraid of anything, you know, and uh, I, it just never entered my mind. Of course, those who don't know, an MGA Roadster has no locks on the doors. Mm. You lift the leather. If the top is up, you lift a leather flap and reach in and pull a cord down to open it. So, I mean, it's just crazy. We shipped um, our belongings such as they were <laughs> To General Delivery, Los Angeles, California, hold for arrival, having no idea how big downtown oh. L.A. was. Of course, that's something you wouldn't even dream of doing now. But in 1961, the world was a lot safer. So we didn't really talk a lot about your education. What did you study? Oh, I just went through high school, and I couldn't afford to go to college. And, of course, back then and where I was, there was no such thing as community colleges or anything like they have now, you know. Mm -hmm. They're given so many opportunities now that it it would have been wonderful 
in my era if we'd have had that. But I did find out that if you worked in banking, you could go to night school free to the American Institute of Banking. So that's what I did. I went to work on a bank and went to night school and studied um, all about negotiable instruments, about contracts, financing, and all of that. And all of those courses have certainly paid off in this career. People might not think of the parallel, but I emphasize all the time when I'm speaking about the music business. Make sure you pay as much attention to the business of that phrase as you do the music. Mm -hmm. How did you become a performer from that point in your life? Well, I was eight years old, and I was in a little school program, and I heard the kids laugh, and I heard them applaud, and I knew right then that was what I wanted to do. I have known since I was eight years old what I wanted to do, and I knew where I wanted to do it because we listened to the Grand Ole Opry as far back as I can remember. That was what we all looked forward to all week was Saturday night, and My dad always made sure that the car radio was battery was charged up in case the Opry didn't come in on the house radio because of static or whatever. We'd go get in the car and uh, we'd drive around till we did get it. That was that simple. And I'd heard, you know, Minnie Pearl and Mr. Acuff and little Jimmy Dickens and I loved what I heard, and that's where I wanted to be. I I say quite often, it was not only important to me to perform on that stage and that show, but I wanted to be a part of that family Mm. that I heard, and that's what my goal was. So let's talk a bit about the Opry then. I recently heard you say that you kind of slid into the role of being the female version of Jimmy Dickens. Tell us a bit more about that. (laughs) Well, Jimmy Dickens, in the later years when he wasn't working on the road that much, and he loved being the opening act on the Grand Old Opry. He loved welcoming everybody and mm. kind of setting the mood where we're not all serious here. We're going to laugh and have some fun. That's what we're all here for. And I watched him every minute thinking, one day I would like to be there and doing that. And that's really where I am now because the road is, I've been out there, I've I've done that and it's harder now. It's not as much fun to travel as it once was. Mm. And um, I just like being home at the Opry now. And I fortunately do have that position where I get to do what I learned from Mr. Dickens. So you've got a reputation as a bit of a maverick, which I think can be a game changer. Tell us a bit about that and the Opry. Well, you know, the word maverick (laughs) can be taken, (laughs) I think, two different ways. Mm. Anytime I think you speak up, when you see something that seems wrong or unfair, By speaking up, I guess that is being a bit of a maverick, but it's done in a constructive way. So if you can be a maverick and constructive, then I guess so. I just saw some, well, the first change I made was the whole issue over the miniskirt, which the relevance of that was, not the miniskirt. It was just that I wore something so different from what everybody was wearing and the gingham and the ruffles that just seemed to be an unwritten rule there. And, of course, moving here from California and going on the Opry immediately, I didn't realize that. So when I did that, it was (laughs) totally an accident. But once I got away with wearing something different, then the other girls had the freedom to wear whatever they wanted to wear, whether it was pantsuits or sequins or whatever. So that was that change. The other change about the way we were introduced, I don't know if you remember the old show Teddy Bard had called Off Stage many years mm-hmm. ago, and I was on that show. And he said, somebody told me that you don't like the way you're introduced quite often. 
And I said, well, I'm not. I'm not pleased with how I'm introduced or the other female artist. Because I said, they say the same thing about every one of us. So, And it was like, here's a cute little girl got on a pretty little outfit. It's like, please, that's not an introduction uh. to somebody. And they never once would acknowledge your hit record or your fine band or a song you that, that you had written. None of that. It was always just this reference. And the other girls hated as much as I did, but nobody said anything. And also they said the same thing about all of us. I mean, it was like we were all lumped together mm. and they didn't bother to find out anything that was different about us. But I remember when I said that, brought that up, <laughs> Dottie West was one of them. She said, Jeannie, I'm just afraid they won't introduce you at all. <laughs> <laughs> She said, we can't change it. And I'm like, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't changed in her time, even mm. at the incredible heights that Dottie climbed to in her career. Well, I think it's good to challenge the norms. And it sounds like you've made some significant headway and even not meaning to do so. I think there are mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities where... I've heard other groups right now talk about similar introductions and saying we're not all, you know, it's not a cookie cutter music. We're not all right. alike. So what's it like to be experiencing a bit of a resurgence of your music when younger and new performers are singing your songs? It's absolutely wonderful to hear younger artists choose a song that I had something to do with. Because, you know, we live in the most creative, productive city, I think, in our country, in the world. So there are so many great songs out there. So anytime anyone chooses one of mine, I'm just absolutely overwhelmed and so grateful. And it just inspires you to want to work harder and write some more, which is kind of the turn my career has taken now. That's the direction I want to put most of my focus in there again, being off the road. I want to turn back to songwriting a little bit more. Maybe part of that is because, you know, if the song's good enough, they don't care about your age. And <laughs> We're discussing being over 50 and Everybody knows that changes the whole perspective as an entertainer, especially for a female entertainer. It's not always a fair situation. So in writing, do you intend to perform as well? And do you go, want to go back into the studio and record? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'll continue to record. If nobody else wants to record me, I know how to do it myself. So <laughs> I'll do my own projects and... And that's something I'm proud of, too, because to be able to be creative, to write a song to begin with, and then to be able to go in the studio and explain to the musicians and everybody what you hear in your mind, especially when you're not a musician like I'm not. But, yeah, I'll continue to do that. And of course, once you write, then you can do the demo sessions, too. So I'll... Uh, I'll always be doing something in that area, and I'm learning so much. You know, with today's technology, as we were speaking earlier, we can do things now that we couldn't have done years ago. So that's a challenge for me, but it also is fun to learn it. I think that's fabulous, and I see that you're super active on social media and other places, too, in the community. And to your point, we can all learn throughout our life. It seems like so many people look at older adults and say, oh, you know, you're over 50 or 60. You don't, you know, do whatever, and that's really not the case anymore. I think many people thrive on learning and doing new things. Well, you look through history, a lot of inventions, a lot of medical discoveries, a lot of things that have changed our whole world were done by people over 60, 70 mm -hmm. even. Some of the poets have said they did their best work after them. We know what we're writing about now. So how important is mentoring and encouraging the next generation to you? You know, being a mentor, when they first talked to me about being that, I had to stop and think, 
I'm being credited for that, but am I doing that? And I think in the beginning when people were calling me a mentor, it was done without my even realizing what I was doing. But then sitting back and looking at at that role, I thought, you know, okay, if they look at you as this, you can do more. And now that you know that you're aware of what they're saying, you can put forth even more effort. So, yeah, it means a lot to me. It means a lot in some areas that if some of us don't teach the people coming up, that perspective may be lost. And so my idea is to teach them, like, for instance, the tradition and the meaning of the Grand Old Opry, what the Grand Old Opry is and why it is such a treasure. And that it's amazing to me when I point out to young people, this is not like any other venue. If you think it is, name me another one. Name me another show or anything that comes close. It is truly something on its own. And the the family perspective behind it, appealing to the families out there that you're reaching out to and entertaining. So what they do with it, once I explain it to them, that's up to them. But it's been interesting to me to watch them. Also to explain and make sure they understand what traditional country music is. Music is changing. It always has. I remember hearing a lot of static when I first came to the Opry about because I was using violins on some of my music (laughs) instead of fiddles, you know. And when I got a little bit um, Southern Rock Edge, you know, and so I would hear that. So every generation brings their own sound, and so this one is no different. But it is up to a few of us to make sure that the people who still love traditional country music can hear it and also to show some of the young people coming up that they don't know whether they like traditional country music or not. They're not hearing it that much. So Mm. that is another role, and like I say, then I... I want to reach out to them and and explain what I can, and then they'll have to take it from there. But I love seeing the new talent come aboard that do care. That's kind of like carrying on our legacy, if you will, and I guess that makes us all feel good. Yeah, that's wonderful. Tell us a bit about your Grammy Award-winning Don't Touch Me, the song that you recorded you know, a number of years ago, but such a classic. Yeah, that was recorded in 1966. And uh, Hank Cochran had taken me to Fred Foster at Monument Records. And uh, when Fred finally said, okay, find us the right song and we'll go in and record for Monument. So we started looking through songs and hadn't found that one thing that just had that magic. I was on the road actually with Porter Wagner. It was in Rochester, New York. Hank was on on the road with some songwriters somewhere in Indiana. And he called me and he had the first verse and he said, do you like this? And truthfully, the first line just knocked me out. Your hand is like a torch. Which you, and I'm like, Boy, that describes so very much if you're saying it to somebody or if you're hearing it. So anyway, I told him I did like it. So back then you could jump on a plane at the last minute. And so he did and flew to New York, Rochester, New York, and actually finished the song in my dressing room at the auditorium there that night. But Hank was into the scotch a little bit, and the next morning he called my room and said, "Um, I think I wrote a hit last night. Tell me you remember it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this. I've always been so grateful for that song, too, because it has stood the test of time. Mm. It could have been written yesterday because it appeals to everybody. And you don't have to be young, old, male, or female to sing that song Mm. and uh, to watch the audience reaction is a gift every time. 
So you also have a passion for acting, and I know you've done some things in local theaters. you want to talk a little bit about acting and your acting career? Well, I have said this many times. Acting is another one of those things that maybe saved my life and my career. I had reached a point where it seemed like nothing was going right in my personal life or my professional life. Everything was just stalled, and I didn't know where I was. I didn't feel a part of anything. And a friend of mine, Michael Thrasher, said, uh, I'm going to put in to direct this little whorehouse in Texas. And he said, if I get it, you've got to be Miss Mona for me. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> fine, whatever. Didn't think about it. And then he called me one day and said, we got it. We got to do it. I'm like, Michael, I don't know how to do this. And he said, yeah, you do. You're absolutely natural. He said, you just got to learn to do things a little bit, a little different approach on the stage acting as you do on the stage singing or doing television. And so when he worked with me and I, and I learned from some of the other actors and then from some of the subsequent shows that I did, I've learned things that I've now applied back to what I do normally and it improves that performance as well. Acting is a very demanding thing. I have a whole new respect for actors after really doing theater for a while because it's hard work. So how do you find time to do all of that and hand in hand with that question, what's your secret sauce for remaining healthy and relevant? Well, you know, I have always, uh, first of all, uh, been very blessed. I, I thank God for the health that I've had. But going way back, I was taught to eat very healthy. And there, like I said, we grew up way out in the country. There was no such thing as fast food back then. Mm. We grew what we ate. And so that's just the way I learned to eat. And that's the way I've always eaten. I've never liked fast foods. And um, I still don't. I don't eat very much fried food. And uh, I try to stay as active as I can. Now, basically, I do yoga stretches and I walk and ride my bicycle. My husband and I have the three-wheel bicycles, and like a lot of seniors have, and I recommend it to anybody. I was telling somebody about the three wheels. I said, I love it because, you know, you can stop and talk to your neighbors or whatever. You don't have to worry about your balance. You don't have to pay attention to that. I said, Mm -hmm. I feel like at this age, I've paid attention long enough. I'm paid in full. I'm not paying attention (laughs) to anything anymore. (laughs) Do you have a mentor or someone in your life who has encouraged you to be the community leader you are today? Yeah, I think community-wise, actually, my husband has set a very good example, and that's where I was aware of him, actually, first of all. I've always believed in supporting your community, so I always attended all the chamber events, although I wasn't a member. And through that, I saw Gene Ward speak at different things, thought he was so funny. And I watched, here again, I guess as an entertainer, I saw how the effect he had on people as he could suggest a thing and I could see their reaction that they could see the overall good for the community. And so I think he has been a tremendous role model for me. I use, uh, said that, told him one time, I said, well, when you become president of the chamber, I'll be the first member you sign up. Well, I was just carrying on. I didn't really mean it. So the morning that he was inducted as the new president, I went up to congratulate him like everybody else. And and he reached in his jacket pocket and handed me an, an application for membership. <laughs> so I'd say he got me involved. Also, Lucy Fouch kept encouraging me 
She said, you go to all the chamber things, and, and then we leave, and you tell me what was wrong. She said, you need to serve on the board, and, and you do have great ideas. You need to participate in these things. So between Jean Ward and Lucy Fouch, I think they have been my mentors there. Now, uh, in today's world, my friend Terry Williams Nutter, who is the director of the chamber now, Terry and I have been friends for many years, and she actually used to sing in my group with me. So I have become more involved again with Terry supporting her efforts in our community. I'm so proud to say that I truly live and work in my community. And a lot of people live somewhere else and come into our wonderful community to work. But I chose to live here. I think anybody who doesn't live Donaldson Hermitage area is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> It is a beautiful area. What would you tell your younger self about being in the music business? First thing I'd tell myself is you were right. You were right. What you felt in your heart and that passion you felt and your desire to be a part of that, you were absolutely right at eight years old. Mm -hmm. If I could say something to that younger self, I would have said... You let too many people discourage you. Don't, don't. In the end, I stuck to my guns about it, but I did get sidetracked in many ways, and I think I would have tried to do it sooner. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what it would be like to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. What would that mean to you? I think being inducted into the Hall of Fame it just validates your life's work and that you did contribute something. And if it could happen for me, I would like for it to happen while I can still be active and use that platform to be a living example, if you will, of, of passing that on to younger people saying it can be a dream out there. Don't ever quit dreaming. But to make dreams come true, you have to work. So you got to keep working, too. And I would say network, make friends and network everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And be aware of what your industry needs, as well as we talked about the community, needs in the community. Be aware of what your industry needs and what can you contribute to it. Because all of those things are the steps leading to the Hall of Fame, I think. And I would be tremendously honored to be there with my peers. I want to ask you a question that we're asking all of our guests that we really have heard some interesting things about. A piece of advice maybe that your parents or an older adult said to you maybe when you were young, very young, and at the time you thought that was silly, but now that phrase rings true in your everyday life. Well, the one that comes to my mind and my mother she used to put up little signs every now and then, and if I was frustrated with something at school or whatever, here would be this, or she would say it, or the little sign would appear that said, if you think you are beaten, you are, and if you think you can't, you won't. Brilliant. That's beautiful. And look what that's brought you today. Yeah. So we have one closing question, and that is, Jeannie, what is it that you do to squeeze the day? Oh, my goodness. I try to cram everything into it that I can. I truly believe that every day is a gift, and you can't always make it at the end of the day what you wanted it to be, but try to do as much of that as you can. And I also have a sign that's always on my back patio that I can see out my dining room or kitchen table that says happiness is a choice. Mm -hmm. And you can't change everything around you, but you can change what you do. All of that plus a glass of wine and watch the sunset when we're good. <laughs> I'm with you, sister, on that, all of that. <laughs> I didn't mention, but since you're with 50 Forward, I would like to say 
how much I enjoyed doing the plays, the theater things, and how proud I am in our community out here of the Larry Keaton Theater. Some amazing productions are being done there. Thank you so much for sharing that. And in so many ways, I think it's a gem in the Donaldson community that every time you walk into there, you don't know what sort of cast members you're going to meet, what sort of productions. And I I really am glad that you've not only been on that stage, but that you're encouraging others to check it out. Oh, absolutely. And uh, always the meals have always been good, too. It's just it is such a great thing for our community. I feel sorry for the communities that don't have that. And also, let me say, too, that that's all well and good if the community doesn't support it. But I am amazed at how wonderful the people in this community are to support the theater. Mm. And uh, I thank them for that. Yeah, Nashville is such a creative town, but there are so many artistic efforts everywhere. And it's wonderful to see people supporting the arts. I think it gives so much back to people's lives. That is one other thing I say to people, very young people who are maybe not sure they want a career, is I'll say, whatever you like to do, do it. It doesn't matter what level. You don't have to be a professional singer or actress. Just do what makes you happy. Do it on to whatever level you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. What an amazing life of leadership we're witnessing from interviews and stories such as yours. I can't wait to run into you in the Donaldson community now. Okay, thank you so much. 